Uh, welcome everybody to our fireplace series. Uh, we're delighted that you could join us. Um, we've been doing this every Thursday for several months now, and it's been the fireplace series has been just a great way of um, highlighting the work that our BCCA fellows are are doing um, all the time, and and especially during the quarantine. Uh, it's been a wonderful way, uh, as part of our virtual BCCA, to bring people together. Uh, and um, tonight is a very special episode of, of our of our fireplace series because we're going to introduce you to three board members uh, bcca has 17 board members um, we're in an unusual position right now of course because we're we're closed to fellows um, but we're working hard every day getting ready to the time when we can bring fellows back uh, and um, we have three people here three of the 17 uh, who are helping us to helping to lead us through this rather challenging time and I, I want to introduce them uh, to you. Um, we have uh, Hazel Duncan. Hazel, say hello. Hi. Okay. How's everybody? <laughs> uh, hey, Hazel uh, is the director of finance and accounting uh, for the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, many of you know that um, we, the VCCA, now has an office in Richmond, and our development and communications offices are now in the same building as Hazel. So um, yeah. Hazel is our, is our work neighbor. Um, and she's also been a member of our of our finance committee. And uh, we've gotten to know Hazel through that work. And uh, it became very clear that she could be a great addition to our board of directors. And so we're, we're thrilled that um, that uh, that Hazel is uh, is now joining the board. Um, uh, Hazel, uh, uh, prior to joining the BMFA in Richmond, served as treasurer and chief financial officer uh, and executive director um, for over um, uh, 12 years at Longwood University. Uh, and she's managed a myriad of, of other nonprofit organizations uh, in her 40-year uh, career. Um, Hazel grew up in New York, and she holds a number of advanced degrees, uh, including an MBA and a doctor in business administration, focusing on organizational leadership. And uh, we're delighted that that Hazel is here. So thank you for being here tonight, uh, and for um, for being on on the board. Um, and then Christina, I'm going to go ahead and and, and introduce Juan and uh, and uh, and Dolores. Um, so I don't need to, right? Excuse me. No, no, go ahead. No, no, I'm waiting. Yeah, great. Other two board members, um, Dolores Johnson. Hello, Dolores. There Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, is uh, a four-time VCCA fellow. Uh, she is an essayist and a memoirist uh, and a retired business executive. Um, her nonfiction writing focuses on interracialism and her new memoir uh, called Say I'm Dead, uh, a family memoir of race, secrets, and love, was published in June of 2020 uh, by Chicago Review Press. Um, Dolores holds degrees from Howard University and the Harvard Graduate School of Business. She has served on many boards uh, and has extensive uh, experience in diversity consulting uh, and nonprofit board leadership. Uh, she was born in Buffalo, New York, and she currently lives in Cambridge, Mass. And uh, Dolores, again, we are delighted um, to have you. Um, uh, you've been a, a part of VCCA for a very long time as a fellow. Uh, and we're delighted to, you know, to welcome you into this this new role uh, as as a as a board member, and uh, to uh, have you read for us uh, this evening. Um, very very happy to have you here. It's entirely my pleasure. Yeah. And uh, last but not least, Juan Granados. Hello, Juan. <laughs> um, Juan is a, a two-time DCPA fellow. Uh, he is a visual artist, philanthropist, and former advertising executive. Um, he's from Buenos Aires, and he now, he now calls Charlottesville home. He's just a few miles over that way from me right now. So <laughs> um, Juan is now a full-time visual artist, um, and he's had a number of um, uh, multiple group, he's had a number of, um, excuse me, he's had a number of group and individual shows. Um, he uh, was honored to have his work chosen uh, for the first Taubman Museum um, of Art uh, Triennial. Um, and uh, he's been very active, uh, actively involved um, in LGBT civil rights movement, in the LGBT civil rights movement in the U.S. And uh, Juan, uh, again, we're uh, just delighted uh, that you have um, 
move from being, you know, a fellow um, into um, uh, the board or onto the board. And I uh, couldn't be happier to have you in that new position and uh, to have you showing um, your work to us this evening. So thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, all my pleasure. I, I love physically that place. It gave me more than I can ever give back. Yeah. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. So. So I really just wanted to introduce everybody to our wonderful new board members. We're really thrilled to have three such wonderful people joining the board and all at the same time. Um, we're really very lucky and um, can't wait to start working with you. Um, we've already had a number of meetings, but we have our first board meeting tomorrow. Um, you know, I, I should say that there's, there's a certain bittersweet quality to this meeting because normally we would all be in New York. Um, our September, our September uh, board meeting is usually in New York. And, uh, we have a fellows reunion um, on the Thursday night before the, the Friday board meeting. Um, last week, uh, last year rather, we were at the New York Recon Cafe and had a great reading and uh, wonderful uh, time with fellows before our board meeting. Um, and we can only only hope that next year, uh, God willing, um, we'll all be um, in New York again. And this will be the one year that we look back and say, remember that year when we were all on, on Zoom together? Um, so, um, looking forward to that time, uh, I want to turn things over to Christina Chu, who's going to be our host for this evening. So, Christina. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I know I just got to meet Juan tonight, but I've actually met um, E. Dolores Johnson earlier. I've had the opportunity to host with her reading before, and she is spectacular. Um, since Kevin has already introduced them, I just want to save more time for them to read and show their work and with um, and have some more time for questions. So everyone, please welcome E. Dolores Johnson. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. It's great to be with you again tonight. Thanks to VCCA, Christina Chu, and all of you who are joining us tonight. It's uh, my pleasure to read for you. In this scene of my book, Say I'm Dead, my black father and white mother tell us their adult children for the first time how they did the unthinkable in 1942 Indianapolis. The Negro cabbie asked Ella twice if she was sure of the address, if she wanted the colored side of town. She assured him she did. And when the cab pulled up at his place, Charles was waiting on the sidewalk. As he helped her out, the cabbie turned all the way around in his seat to glare at Charles. And why you wanna mix me up in something like this? Just take the dollar, Charles said. You haven't seen a thing, understand? She went into his room at the boarding house and sat in the nicked easy chair as Charles fixed the Coke she asked for, adding a splash of whiskey before pouring a straight one for himself. She raised her glass and made the toast the boys at her acting group taught her. Here's to it and to it again. If you don't do it when you get to it, you'll never get to it to do it again. He liked the life in her eyes and the spirit in her soul. Without it, he realized, she would never have come over here to be with him. Charles turned on the radio to a moody blues tune. Then a colored announcer came on. Hey, all you cats out there, it's Saturday night. Get your best girl and cut a rug with us for the party Jeep keeps a going all night long. He pulled her up to dance, though she protested that she wasn't much good. Ella Fitzgerald was on and while they tried, Neither could follow what the other was doing. She knew the foxtrot with its set patterns, and he knew the country mule. They laughed through false turns and stepping on each other's toes, but when a slow tune came on, they did better. Charles folded her into his chest, and she followed his simple steps. In no time, they were cooking dinner together at his place a couple of nights a week. But as they grew into love, Charles began to worry. He didn't think she understood the trouble she could get in for being with him. Did this white girl even know she could be attacked in the street for it? Did she have any idea of what she could face for breaking the unwritten Jim Crow code? Some of the Indianapolis and Marion County elected officials were open members of the Klan. 
they posed as the good guys doing community service, like giving away wheelchairs and food to whites only. But did Ella understand that the Grand Wizard, a man named Stevenson, used to run the nationwide Ku Klux from Indianapolis? That they hated Negroes so much that they terrorized and killed them? She didn't. Two Negro men got lynched in Marion a few years before he and Ella took up. After a robbery and murder, a white woman claimed rape. The suspected men were locked up briefly until a white mob broke into the jail with sledgehammers and struck them up. Charles saw a picture postcard of the lynching taped up next to the price list at the black barber shop. On it, a big crowd of men and women milled around the brown bodies hanging from trees, their white faces satisfied. The victims' heads bent over their nooses where their necks had broken, their limp legs dangling free. Their bodies were left on display as whites congratulated themselves on delivering vigilante justice. That was the proof, the man in the next barber's chair told Charles, of how the Klan was the law in Indianapolis. Don't take no chances in these parts, he said. Nobody has been called to account. As happened at many lynchings, a studio photographer shot a ghastly picture, then sold thousands of copies, like circus souvenirs, to white people who wanted a keepsake. Charles sat Ella down to explain how it was. Somebody could get the law on him because of their relationship, trump up the charges, throw him in jail, beat him half to death or lynch him for touching a white woman, and nobody would do a thing about it. He was getting pretty scared, and she should be too. Ella had to understand that for her part, the place where they both worked would fire her if they found out. It would be a scandal and all white people would turn their backs on her. My brother David was listening to this as he wiped his brow with the handkerchief he always carried. He asked incredulously, you mean this was the first you heard of any of this mama? How could you not know? My life had only been in the white community up to then, mama said. I was completely sheltered from that kind of thing. Negro business wasn't my business, nor anyone's I knew. My family didn't follow politics or race, or even if they had, a lynching wasn't anything to talk to a young lady about. When your father explained all this to me, I had only the slightest idea. Charles wanted Ella to think these risks through before they saw each other again. She had to decide if the risks were worth it. Could she live with her family never knowing about them? To staying alert all the time so they never made that one mistake that would ruin their lives? He took Ella by the shoulders and finally said he loved her. Loved her so much he was willing to face those dangers. Charles's forehead swept and his voice dropped deep with desperation when he said he had to be sure she loved him the same way. He pulled her close and stroked her thick curls. Take some time now to think hard before you answer me, he said. I mean it. And if you don't come back, I'll understand. Thank you. Wow, that was wonderful. Oh my gosh, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for reading that. Um, you. No, it really, points to all the different themes in your book at, that are so relevant and timely and important right now. Um, but first, let's let's talk a moment about the title. Say I'm Dead is is the title. What what why did you choose this title? What does it mean? The title comes from something my mother said. Um, in my 30s, a light bulb went off that even though I had been raised as a black person entirely, lived in a ghetto, went to a black university, <laughs> married a black man, belonged to the black Baptist church. I had never 
counted my white heritage. In fact, society didn't count it. We were mixed race kids. We were all Negroes because there's a one drop rule that actually originated in the state of Virginia uh, that stated if a person had one drop of Negro blood, they had to be Negro. And that carried through to the time of my own birth. But when the light bulb went off for me, I went home and asked for a family dinner so that we could all get together. I had two brothers. One was a black militant who wore a dashiki and had an afro the size of a pumpkin. And my oldest brother pretty much was passing for white. Black father, white mother, and myself were all sitting around the table when I bring up this question and I say, I had done the genealogy on my black father's side back to discovery of the African who was brought here as a slave and landed in Virginia. And now I had realized our entire white family was and had always been missing. They simply did not exist because my family never spoke of that secret. And so I asked my parents, as we all sat together over dinner, who and where our white family was. My mother, who had buried this secret for 36 years, she had been missing from her family for 36 years, didn't want me to take up this subject. She couldn't overcome 36 years of grief and, and secrets. And I persisted because I felt that my own identity had tilted once I realized that there were no branches on my mother's family tree. So I only half knew who I was and I needed to know, really, like everyone else, where do I come from? So I said to my mother, how about if you tell me where they are and who they are and I go and look for them? She said, I can't face them after what I did. I would be so guilt ridden and, and unable to, to explain myself. I don't want anything to do with such a thing. And I said, well, how about if I go and find them for myself and I leave you completely out of it? She said, well, if you wanna do that for yourself, you can. And I said, well, then what am I to say about you? She said, say I'm dead. Wow. Wow, wow, that is really incredible. That's a beautiful title. Thank you. Actually, and let me say that I got my title with a focus group that was conducted over dinner at VCCA with my other fellow writers. Yay, VCCA! <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, yeah, you, you get to meet such great people and you, you know, do. get inspired, and you so many wonderful ideas that cross-pollinate. It's amazing. Um, so let's get back to the themes that uh, we were talking about. There's a lot of um, overt racism you endured in Baton Rouge, and there's a scene in your book. Could you talk a moment about that? Yes. Well, um, my husband and I uh, both, we, we were both uh, feeling our oats. We were uh, double degreed uh, professionals in New York City who landed these big jobs in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And my father told us, you don't know anything about the Deep South. You have no business going down there. You're not going to be <laughs> safe in Louisiana. And we thought, oh, he's out of step. This was in the mid 70s. And everything has changed. The civil rights laws have passed. So we'll be fine. And we got down there and actually, um, after being refused one house that we tried to buy, being told that um, if they sold to any inward, they couldn't sell the rest of their houses and shut the door in our face. We went on to get a realtor who um, was able to help us get a house in a more established neighborhood. And a few days after we moved in, there was um, a knock on the door at night and we opened the door and there was a cross burning on our front lawn. Um, there's a lot more to that story, but that was only some 
of the overt racism that we experienced. Well, yeah, and you must buy the book so you can read about read about all of it. Um, she's just touching the iceberg. Um, <laughs> Can you also talk a little bit about the systemic racism um, that you endured that um, really matters so much today? Well, systemic re racism is a reality that a lot of people question today. They don't seem to understand what it's about, but I will give you some examples from my book that I experienced myself. Um, as a high school student, I was a straight A student in honors and AP classes. And um, having a, a father who went to sixth grade and a mother who went to ninth grade, I had no knowledge of college education. And yet all of my, we were bused, the black kids were bused across town to a school where the, which was high performing. And in those honors and AP classes, my classmates were all enthusiastically pursuing their college applications. And I wondered, well, what is that all about? And so my trigonometry teacher told me to go and uh, ask the guidance counselor for help because I, she thought I should go to college too. And when I went in my beautifully pressed white shirt and my special skirt, um, she asked me what she could do for me, the guidance counselor. And I said, well, so ignorant about college, I didn't know how to frame my questions. I said, I'm here to know about going to college. And her eyebrows went up and she said to me, oh no, Dolores, colored girls don't go to college. And she reached around to a city directory and she wrote out something on a slip of paper and handed it to me. And she said, if uh, you do anything after high school, you should go to the vocational school here. Here's the phone number and take up sewing. And with that, she showed me out. Now, I knew I wasn't supposed to go take up sewing because in my spotless straight A report card, I had one D in sewing. <laughs> and so she had never even looked at my records. But this is what happens even today to black children. The low expectations for the black students permeates the school system such that kids' possibilities are so derailed by systemic racism in the teaching staff, the advising staff, and so forth. Um, there are other examples I could give, but I don't want to give take too much time on that one question. Um, I think you one one aspect I find um, really wonderful about you is that you were an executive um, in your last career. Uh, your business business executive at at IBM, correct? Um, oh. IBM did buy the software company where I was working, so yes. What was it like as a person of color um, to be in corporate America? How uh, how did that feel and work? Um, the first position that I had out of graduate school was one where after going through uh, several uh, layers of interviews, I came to my final interview where there were 13 men sitting in chairs around me popping questions at me like, why do you want a man's job? What makes you think you can do this job? Anyway, I got the job and um, it turned into um, a great uh, exhaustion, not the work because I could do the work and uh, I was good at what I could do. But with the second job that came with being a black person in an all white corporation in 1972. I found that um, it was necessary to code switch all the time. I couldn't speak the language that was natural to me. I had to filter it. I had to filter my movements. I had to hesitate and translate what was being presented because people didn't wanna take me seriously. And so for the first few years that I was in business, it was quite a struggle to make people pay attention. I would uh, work all weekend on problems that we were gonna meet about and bring a, a solution. And when I stated it, everybody ignored me. They went on talking among themselves and then um, a white man would say something an hour later that was identical to what I said and they would think it was a great idea. It was only when I 
learn to speak up that um, I was able to cut through all of that. And I would just call people out when they did things like that um, without fear because I just couldn't be there trying to make my best contribution and not have, not be respected. So I fought back in my own way. They're so incredible. Um, so we have a question. Karen Bell asks, what year was this? And I believe she was talking about your experience in school. Um, I graduated from Harvard Business School in 1970. And uh, I was in corporate America in several different companies from that period after graduating until the early 2000s when I switched to nonprofit management. Wow, and you are one tough cookie. I worked overseas. I, you know, I rose up uh, within the corporation, and um, I had a book of business in 28 countries, um, and ran a worldwide operation of two billion dollars. So um, they did finally have faith in me. <laughs> Thank you so much for reading for us tonight. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. Thank you, Christina. I believe we are going to uh, move on to um, to Juan Manuel Granados. Yes, there you are. Hi. How are you? Good. 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 So Kevin introduced you already. So um, what I would really like to do at this point is start looking at your work. And um, everyone, I had a chance to see all of his work earlier today and it blew me away. And wait till you see it, you're just gonna be blown away. It was just, what are, what are the words that I, usually I'm not an, um, someone who can appreciate work that isn't, um, that is abstract. But then I realized, yes, I can. I absolutely felt it was in many ways transcendent in some ways. So um, please, everyone, welcome Juan. Um, and everyone also, um, you'll be able to see some of the slides. So please write in some questions. If you can't see anything clearly, please let us know. Um, Juan Manuel Granados um, was introduced earlier, so. Here we go. Hi. Uh, well, like like Dolores, I, I have a past in corporate America, and I work in advertising as a creative director in Buenos Aires and in New York uh, for, I don't know, every, every, every product available, I don't know, from beer to Coca-Cola to... Um, medicine everything I, I don't i don't remember don't do cars i don't remember doing anything i travel a lot and shoot in a lot of places but i did that for many many years many many years and after a while when we moved from new york city here to virginia to raise our children that uh, and i started doing some some few jobs uh, online well i usually do like pitchings uh, help agencies to to get new accounts but i started that's what it emerged myself in the last seven years in full-on painting and so i think abstract for me was a way to to leave all these um kind of the advertising work and all this information with a mission uh, away and go just completely submerge in something uh, abstract with not a, a clear objective or with a, not a clear message where just the message was was put it like in the air and people just capture whatever they want to capture. Uh, I, I didn't want to have a, a, a bold movement. Actually, I do draw a, lo a lot of figurative images. I do, I love portrait and everything, but it, what it represents me or what I need to do right now is, is abstract. And, and usually these kind of movements were fascinate me, which is always like bird flocks, uh, water movements, uh, just texture of stones. Uh, and usually I, I work with individuality, it could be like crosses or circles, and that, that would create the full shape. So uh, it's eight o'clock. And so uh, this is like this black one right here, for example, this is like very like watery movement or like a stone movement, like oceans, uh, like stones, something about like the, the um, what always fascinated me, we were talking with Christina today, uh, like always fascinated me when in a bird flock, this sense of 
how the individual make the whole and how it works for everything else and how we just completely lost the sense of individuality when we work in a group. And it, it happened in bird flock, it happened in humans. I think we just lost the sense of individuality when when people behave like a moth, it just loop, lost the sense of, of a person. It just, just you become something else. You become part of the of the group, and you just lost individuality, which is could be a problem. But at the same time, it's this phenomenon that it happened. I think I think you just when you see it more clear for me is with bird flocks. It's just fascinating. Like it just it could be like thousands of birds, like just floating at the same time. It's, it, it, flying at the same time, it just is, nobody, everybody just flows. And I read a lot of theories about this, if it's the aerodynamics or something, but it's just fascinating how one turn and they all turn at the same time. It just, and that, that's one of the things that captivated the most. And and I lost, I, I just in life enjoy in lost myself like painting. I really, for me, it's like almost like meditation. I, I, I love the process. And I just would enjoy like in BCCA because I have like this, private like these private times like i rarely have that is the the not interruption quality uh, 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 i really really enjoy it and what that uh, i usually work in monochromatic that's another one uh, i like golds and like silvers and white i put a couple examples in with that other pictures of paintings on, on a wall, just to have an idea of, of the scale. Uh, that's a, that, that's, um, that's a four layers. I, th this actually represents the four seasons. Actually, I'm not, so this is the one, I was a commission, otherwise I would not go so thematic. And that's, that's the, 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 the stairs where they, they, there was installation uh, with that animal there. Uh, and that's my studio. And I'm from Argentina, so you see in the next picture, you will see is uh, I'm very clean because I paint very little, so you have to be kind of organized. Uh, and I create my own acrylic pencils to, 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 to paint. So basically you create the color of the paint and you can, what is it? That's the mate, that's what we drink in Argentina. That's it's like Argentinian version of coffee. Uh, and so I create a very, uh, uh, with acrylic paintings, I, I, I fill up the markers uh, and I create paintings. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I've used many times um, black, uh, uh, white out pencils. I love those. I really, really like this. And I use them a lot. I think I use them in this painting that is wood. Uh, they just have this, they have a, a, a tiny bit of blue. They're a little thick and they could run easily, but I kind of have the timing of them right now but uh, they're very thick and and have a tiny little blue and they are the, the painting is very thick so i really i really enjoy paint with those uh, really for me it's fun it's very fun so and uh, then another layer of people it, like it, i i'm an immigrant and everything i paint is about birds and movement and water and movement and going away so maybe something my therapist can talk you about <laughs> i'm still writing about like keep on moving keep on finding my place and find my group and try to move with a group uh, but when i paint it I, I see something else but maybe deep inside i still just finding myself and i don't know <laughs> try to migrate and find myself as an immigrant at the same time so um, Juan, I, um, before I um, say anything else, I just want to add some, there's so many questions. People are just oh, so crazy. Awesome. So uh, I, it's blowing up here. So uh, Sheila Pleasance wants to know, what is the medium? Well, I usually I like, uh, I, I like, the, the, I make acrylic pencils uh, that I paint with acrylic pencils. I paint with brush, acrylic brush, little, little, little brush. But they had to be very small. You had to. They had to dry very fast. I cannot do oil. Take too long, and it's too dangerous for me, as a medium. So acrylic, uh, uh, and I, uh, and then I like to use wide out pencils. Oh, those little crosses. Yeah, uh, yeah. Why? Not this one is, for example, too small. When it's a little thicker, because uh, I don't know, it will be like I don't know, like a quarter of an inch, or I don't know what it's. In, I know in centimeters, but it will be like, I don't know, five millimeters. That will be the thickness. It was just too big sometimes for a painting, but it, it grabs so well if you work in horizontal 
Uh, and I really like to draw, because you have a little bit of three-dimensionality. Uh, it's not completely flat like acrylic, which is very nice. It depends on the painting. Every painting is, is a little more rustic. Uh, I think uh, the, the whiteouts, I love it. I really like to work with whiteout. Wow. That's Boxes cool. of whiteout everywhere. <laughs> um, so do you start from one side of the canvas or do you have a concept before you start or does it evolve? I usually enjoy the process of, I have a kind of idea in my head and I, I have a couple of canvases and I enjoy the process of, of preparing the canvas. And so prepping the canvas is, I don't know, it's like, I don't know, start to, I don't know, falling in love with the piece, right? And you start to see all the, all the levelings and every, all the levelings and the levels. And then I start painting it and find the color and start, find the base. And, and I, sometimes it's just to see just the natural movement of what the base that I created, what is happening. Maybe it's just go what I have in my head, but I always try to be a little bit open, see what's going on. Sometimes I have a super clear idea what I want. This one is really big. This one is not the, I have one of those that are really big. It took me months, like literally months. And as getting more, I get more work. I start very fast and then I start getting at the end. It probably happened with books as well. I started to the end, I started slowing down and slowing down. I can, I can work the first like very fast with a lot of hours, but then because I work so small, I had to take perspective, I had to step down, step out, step out to see what's going on. Sometimes I take pictures with my iPad to see what's going on, to have a better perspective. And I get a sketch in the iPad and I continue drawing. Wow, this is um, actually dovetails into Susie Surik's question. She's curious about the process. Um, are the flocks or the water flows from the direct experience of the phenomena or the photos, films, etc.? No, I, I don't go through a particular picture. I just uh, I go like emotional memory. I, don't, I never follow any part, no particular. That one is right there, like a wave. Always is fascinated that I, I love Asian art. Like, so it's very obvious. I love the minimalist, minimalism. I love triptychs. I, I really like it. And it's the, 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 the wave, like it's right there on the, on the, on the screen. Like that was a big inspiration. I always loved those paintings. Asian art is a big inspiration. I cannot deny that. But no, I don't, I don't follow any particular movement in, in particular. I, nature in general, nature in general. I love shade. I, what I love is shades of trees also in pavement. And I do take pictures of that. I don't follow those, but I it's, sometimes I paint all oh, shade of nature's in pavement. I don't know why I think it's nice. <laughs> you know what I think is so interesting is, um, and maybe this is part of the uh, minimalist, um, almost Zenish feel of it, but um, you really, so much of the painting is the viewer. I mean, usually you look at a painting, the painter tries to tell you something or depicts something, but really so much of your work is like looking at it and seeing, like every time I looked at it, I saw something kind of different. It was you know what happened to me that? I shower in my shower every day, sometimes two times a day. <laughs> and when I see the stones, you know, happen like you see the marble in the shower. I see I maybe it's my head. I see different figures every single time. I see faces. I think I think it's just this this natural thing we have in our heads. Like we're always looking for something in in in, in somewhere. Like we find, but in every 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 morning in my shower in the the marble, I find different faces or shapes that like we have finding in clouds. And I think probably, I think that's a, the, what I have a the abstract art. It's just, you let your brain just go free. Like, it's like the stars, like the clouds. It's just, you just work, you, your brain go crazy try to figure it out. And it's just, at the same time, it relaxes itself. It did feel very cosmic. If, you know, so, a lot of it just felt, you know, like waves, but also like waves in the universe, you know? Like that way yes i well yes it is it, something about like the the little the little planets right the little the little stars and everything making the whole i don't know the galaxy or something like that yes when you see the real pictures of the galaxies it's just nobody can compare that that is it's amazing like you see those novas and supernovas it's like exactly. yes so um 
you know, when you, you know, the swarms of the birds and, and all of that um, and the motion in your work, um, like I can't really see it because well, I'm just looking at photos, but is the motion from the actual, um, like, is it a three dimensional, like in, in a way that makes it look that way? Or is it the way you, I think some, some have an intention. I like some, this one that we're looking right now, I have the intention to create that tension in the middle, like that tension, that some tension in the middle creates some curve. So some little things I have an intention, or sometimes I have the intention to create a little more three-dimensionality, like if it's like thicker on the in, in the curves, in the middle gets get thinner. I, I just lo love to have a little perception. Some crosses are bigger than others and some circles are bigger than others. So create this idea of a little more three-dimensionality because every have different, different different ideas. Yes, it's a little bit, it's intentional. And um, your, um, your work life, all the things that, the skills that you got from your previous life, did any of it come into this realm? Well, before working advertising, I draw, I draw and paint all my life. My my mother and father were both uh, literacy literacy professors, and uh, and in my house were a lot of books. My father is a journalist, and my father, my mother was a teacher, and I, 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 I was I was always I am very dyslexic, so I was a big disappointment for my parents when I was young. They didn't know what was going on. So drawing was always and painting was always my thing. So that was the only thing I feel strong and confident. And I, advertising was, I think, was a language that could help me to communicate with, I don't know, the real world, the real, and say, so, okay, I can survive in this, in this jungle. Like, I think I can speak my language here. But I think the, 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 this is, when I'm busy here, when I'm painted, it, these are my peeps. This is where the place I feel myself. When you were at PCCA, did you do larger? Huge. I went huge. Yeah. Yes, yes. I, I, I took the advantage of this place. I have a most beautiful studio. I don't remember the name. I should have. Uh, but uh, it, I was great lighting. And I, 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 I packed my car with big, big pieces. And I took some already pre-painted because I already have a big idea what, what I want to wanna do. And then I start at the end when I start finish the pieces that I have in my head. Then it was get hard. It's okay. What are I gonna do the new ones? But I do enjoy enjoy the process to be by myself uh, with music or a podcast and uh, just painting. Yes, I, I do it. I, I enjoy it. And bigger is better. The small is nice because you 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 control is a good rehearsal for a new idea or texture or, or shape or movement. But then I think you had to jump in the big waters. <laughs> it it all actually feels like you're like that painting right there. It feels yeah. like you're jumping into like a, a very busy like um uh, like a like a water that has like the swirling kind of manholeish kind of things. Um, it, that was, yeah, just right right timing. Yes, that's um. Well, there will be like a South American toilet. They're supposed to go the other way around. <laughs> 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 well, that's a pretty, very pretty one. <laughs> a lot of Clorox, a lot of Clorox. It's, 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 it's a long time. <laughs> The, the gold over there, is that a gold? You painted gold first and then? I, it took me a while. Yes, I painted and make a lot of layers because I you had to have some kind of material and a kind of acrylic that keep the keep the goldness and the shininess, but at the same time you can paint, can paint over it. And uh, and uh, so I, I find this strange paint that I find in uh, hardware stores. And after three quotes, it works very well for me. Wow, it's just absolutely lovely. Okay. It is so beautiful. Um, so in terms of what you were talking a little bit about the individual versus the um, the like mass, right? And how like the swarm moves together and, and once it starts to do that, the individual kind of gets lost. How do you feel that resonates or is relevant to who we are as humans and people. Yeah, I don't know. Just I don't know. This it, I, always always surprised. I don't know. Always surprised me. The the, the the 
I, I, what we were saying before this, I think we lost the sense of individuality. I, I think we we think we have in our idea, we, we feel like we're an individual, like I think like the liver thing is an organ and he will kind of work by himself. But I think we all work like a like somehow like like a full organism. I think we are a full organism, all of us. I, I, I think the idea of individual is an existence. I think we all will like really like move together and we have no idea how connected we are, uh, how our jobs, uh, creative jobs and our ideas affects other people. And like even verbally or non-verbally, our gestures, I think we, we move in this, in, this, in this web, like more, more, more tangled than we think we are. And, and we think that the sense of individualism, I don't think really much exists. And this is the phenomenon of like, when somebody thinking in one country something and this- Oh yeah, the zeitgeist. It's, it's fantastic. I think this, that we are, that we're one at the end, right? It's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, thank, thank you, Juan, and thank you, Dolores. You guys were amazing. And everyone is so lucky that you guys are on our board and helping VCCA. We really appreciate it. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Great. And I, I thank you all so much. And Christina, thank you for hosting um, our wonderful host. Uh, and um, we're all, you know, we all have a party to go to now. There's a, a Zoom cocktail party, and I hope you all have the uh, have the link. Uh, you can find it on Virtual VCCA. Um, and Kim, where else? Remind me where else we can people can find it. Kim, Kim's not going to show herself, but um, oh, in the newsletter. Go so to sorry, I can do that. Okay, it should be in your Wednesday cider newsletter. Yes. Kim is, is the person behind the curtain. She's like making all this happen. And, it's magic. Uh, and Real puppets of Kim. Magic. Yeah. Yeah. And if um, if you feel like you haven't gotten a newsletter or don't know what virtual VCCA is, if you go to our website and the events tab, um, if you sign up to receive the link, I'll monitor that and can send it, send it your way. Actually, Dolores and um, Awan, I think uh, after when you see the link, you'll be able to go in and respond to individuals who've written okay. in to you. So you can do that later. Okay, thanks. True. Really great. All right, well, we'll see you all over at Zoom. See you on Zoom. All right, bye.